Today, we are going to be looking at one of the longest narratives in the entire book of Acts, an event where God emphatically helps the disciples realize that the kingdom of God is much, much bigger than they ever imagined. And fundamentally, what this text does say is it answers the question, who's in and who's out? Like, who can call themselves a part of the church? Who can be included in who we are and what we're doing and who can't be counted among us? We're going to be looking at a chapter and a half this morning. We got a lot of work to do. And I was going to trim it down to just read the highlights because it's a lot. But then I realized that if you leave and you say that you didn't like the sermon because there was too much Bible in it, well, that's really a you problem and not a me problem, so we're just going to do the whole thing, all right? Uh, I'm kidding, but nonetheless, we do have a lot of work to do, so we're just going to jump right in this morning. We're going to start in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, and you're going to need to follow along with me, so there's some Bibles, I think, located on the ends of your rows if you don't have one, or you can open up your phone or whatever it may be, Uh, but you're going to need to follow along with me because it was just much too much for me to try to put on slides this morning, Uh, so you're going to need to be kind of looking at it as we're working through it, but Picking up in chapter 10, verse 1, this is what it reads. It says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. All right, so some context to get us started. Uh, In the first century, Judea, which is where most of the events of Scripture take place, Judea was a part of the Roman Empire. It was a small and rather unimportant part of the Roman Empire, but it was a part nonetheless. Rome ruled, and part of how Rome ruled this particular area was through military might. Now, a centurion was a commander in the Roman military. Specifically, it was the commander of 100 men, hence the the relationship between the word centurion and century. It's 100. And a cohort, depending on the location, was about 600 to 1,000 soldiers led by 6 to 10, give or take, centurions. Now, it's worth noting that only Roman citizens and particularly well-connected and well-off Roman citizens could join the military. And becoming a centurion was something that had to be earned. You had to prove yourself. You had to prove your loyalty to the emperor. You had to show competency in giving and receiving commands. You had to be fluent in Latin, the language of the military, which meant you had to be rather well-educated. And for this, centurions were paid very, very well, as much as five times the amount that an ordinary soldier would make. So centurions were these somewhat wealthy and somewhat socially prominent individuals. And this would have been especially true in a place like Caesarea, which was the Roman district capital for basically the whole whole region. So all that being said, when we get introduced to Cornelius, what we're learning about him from the jump is he would have been a pretty important dude and about as thoroughly Roman as you could possibly expect someone in this society to be. So now in case you're unfamiliar, that matters because Rome and the Jews did not have what you would call a a copacetic relationship at this point in time. For the early Jews, of whom many of the first Christians actually came from, Roman officers, especially centurions, were sort of this ever-present reminder that they were a conquered people, for lack of a better way of saying it. Roman soldiers were this tangible reminder of the proverbial bad guy, for lack of a better way to say it. In fact, many people believe that the Messiah was actually supposed to come and overthrow the Roman Empire, come and overthrow all of this military occupation. Uh, Now, Jesus flipped the script on on that notion, revealing that his kingdom was not a kingdom that was of this world, but something different. But there was still this tension that exists between the Jews, including some Jewish Christians and the Gentiles, which would have included Romans and any other nation for that matter. It was sort of a us, God's real people, and them, the unholy, the unclean, or the heathen people mentality. But Even though he was a Gentile soldier in the employ of Rome, we actually find out that there was something significantly different about Cornelius. Verse 2, Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with all his household. 
He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. So it says Cornelius feared God. To call someone in the scriptures a god fear, it was actually a term used for a non-Jewish person who worshipped the God of Israel. Cornelius was not a Jew. He had not undergone certain Jewish initiate or conversion rites like circumcision, but he actually believed that the God of the Bible was the one true God, which was a pretty remarkable thing for a Roman in this particular position. He prayed to this God. He taught his family about this God, taught his family to follow this God, and sought to use his position of wealth and power, not just for himself, but for the good of the community that he was around, which in this case was a particularly Jewish community. Cornelius essentially was a good dude, and God sees his devotion and his faith, and he actually has a message for him. Verse 3, now about the ninth hour of the day, and that's 3 p.m. roughly our time, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, so two Simons in the same house, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. All right, so spoiler alert. He's been told to go find Peter, one of the apostles, and Peter is going to wind up telling Cornelius about Jesus, and Cornelius is going to become a Christian. And I want to point that out here quickly because it reinforces a pattern all over the Bible of how much God likes to use his people to accomplish his purposes. Like, notice, it would have been much, much easier for the angel to just say to Cornelius, hey, Cornelius, great job on worshiping the one true God of Israel. Hey, newsflash, you're right. He is the one true God, and his name is Jesus. He's the Messiah who's come to die for your sin, rose from the dead to make you right with God. No need to go seek out Peter or anything like that. The angel could have just done it all himself, but God doesn't do that because God's primary strategy is to accomplish his purposes through his people. And God also had something he wanted to teach Peter through this process as well. Let's pick up in verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, which would have been around noon. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and their voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. All my hunting buddies call this their like life verse. It's their favorite verse in the entire Bible. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, saying, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. So I know this seems strange, right? Like it's a bit, bit of a strange vision for him to have, but let me unpack it. So there were certain Jewish laws that prohibited people from eating certain types of animals. And there were probably some health and safety reasons for this, but primarily, the primary reason God gave these laws was to give us a picture of what sin actually does to us. So just like eating an unclean animal would make a person unclean, Sin defiles a human and makes a human unclean, unable to be in the presence of God. Now, Jesus' sacrificial death has removed the defilement for sin for all who would receive him. And that is part of what God is showing to Peter in this vision. When it says that all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds, birds, it means there were clean and unclean animals. And God is telling Peter, I am making the unclean things clean. This is what I'm here to do. I'm making the unclean things clean. And God has more in mind here than just strictly food. Verse 17. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. You gotta love God's timing. And called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation for I have sent them. And that's exactly what he does, jumping down to verse 24. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And for what it's worth, I just love this. Like Cornelius knows that God has something life-altering for him, and he is not about to keep that to himself. He invites the whole squad to come over and hear God's message. He wants everyone to be in on what God is doing. For what it's worth, this is what happens when a person knows that God is the good stuff in life. 
This is what happens when a person knows that God is what is ultimate and what everyone needs. You want everyone else to know it too. You wanna bring everyone in on this goodness. And that's what Cornelius does, verse 25. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up for I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. He's starting to understand what God was trying to tell him in this vision about food. Verse 29, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And so Cornelius explains to him how he'd been praying and the vision he had and how the angel told him that God had heard his prayers and to send for Peter. And so he did it immediately. And they were all now gathered to hear whatever message God sent Peter to carry for them. Verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, that word for acceptable there isn't the New Testament word uh, that's used to talk about somebody being saved or anything like that or somebody becoming a Christian. It's a different Greek word. But the idea that Peter is communicating here is that God's favor, his grace, his forgiveness and salvation is available to anyone of any background, of any ethnicity, of any nation. If they repent and place their faith in Jesus, they can be a part of God's people too. God is not partial to any one particular type of person. He's realizing that Jesus didn't just die for Jewish men and women, but for Gentiles too, for all the nations of all the earth. And so Peter goes on to share the good news of Jesus with Cornelius and his crew, how Jesus bled and died for them to forgive them of sin, how he was raised to new life as this testimony of his kingship over God's kingdom, and how this is what the Jewish scriptures were trying to point us towards the whole time, that anyone, anyone who believes in him can receive it. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised, who were, those were the Jewish folks, who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. You remember the last time we saw this was at Pentecost, when the church was born. What Luke is deliberately showing us here is that the church really is expanding to the Gentiles that God's message, his salvation, really is going forward beyond the Jewish people to every other tribe and nation of the world. And Peter likewise is amazed. Then Peter declares, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He's saying, can anyone justifiably exclude these people from God's family? If God is bringing them to faith and giving them his spirit, can anyone justifiably say, no, 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 you guys can't be in because you're not Jewish? And the answer obviously is no, no. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now, eventually this news makes its way all the way back to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. And here's what happens there beginning in chapter 11. Now, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? The Jewish Christians are initially perplexed and are like, how can you do that with them, with Gentiles? They aren't circumcised. Essentially, they aren't like us. They don't do what we do. They don't live like we live. They are different. They're not a part of this thing that the Messiah was creating. Explain yourself, Peter. Why would you do such a thing? Verse four, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. And he tells them every detail about the vision, about what God said, how it happened three times, and how right after that, Cornelius' people showed up and how God had spoken to him too. And when he had shared the message of Jesus with him, the spirit came on them, on the Gentiles, just as it did on the Jews at Pentecost. Verse 16, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? If God was going to do the same thing in them that he did in us, who am I to get in the way of that? 
Who am I to tell them that they can't be a part of God's people? Verse 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Their eyes are opened and they see the mission and the kingdom of God is greater than they ever imagined. They see that who they thought was in wasn't, weren't the only ones who were in. And who they thought was out weren't actually out the whole time. Now, I know that's a long story. It's a lot of ground we just covered, but it's a crucial one. Because you and I, unless we are ethnically Jewish here today, get to call ourselves God's people because of this story because of the realizations that are taking place, because of the work that God is doing. You see that, right? The vast majority of us, if not all of us here today, are Gentiles. If you are a Christian and you are a Gentile believer, and we are considered God's people because of the revelations made in this text, as a soldier in the Roman army, as a commander paid by the Roman emperor, as a citizen of a Roman colonial city, even though he worshiped the one true God, no one thought that Cornelius could rightly be called a part of God's family because he wasn't Jewish. But what God is doing here is he is changing what everyone thought. God confirms what he wants most to create a people from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue on planet earth for all people who would receive Jesus to receive his spirit and become a part of his church. Point being, God welcomes all people to live in the fullness and the freedom of life in Jesus Christ. And Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and his Gentile entourage are the proof. It turns out that God meant what he said to Abraham way back in the Old Testament, that he intended to bless all the nations. Turns out that Jesus meant it when he said that he wanted disciples of all nations and he wanted witnesses to the very ends of the earth. And here in chapters 10 and 11, the promise of Acts 1-8 dramatically crosses this new threshold with multiple Gentiles being invited into the church of God and the Jews cannot deny it. And all of that has very, very meaningful implications and instructions for us today. Cornelius' story impacts how you and I think about the church, how we think about each other, the folks sitting next to you this morning, the folks that you show up each week with in a life group, how you think about the people you work alongside or live alongside, and the people God has placed you around with his good news. It affects all of these things. And so for the rest of our time, what I want to do is I want to draw these things out in hopes that they impact and shape our thinking just like we see they did for the early church here. And so here's the first thing I want to draw our attention to. The message of this story is that everyone, absolutely everyone, is an image bearer of God. An image bearer of God who matters to God. What happens in this story is the natural progression of what theologians call the imago Dei, which is just Latin for the image of God. From, that we, we see this from all the way back in the book of Genesis. So in Genesis 1, it reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God doesn't call anything else in the creative order as made in his image. All of Genesis 1 is God creating a kingdom on earth that is perfect and good. And at the top, at the pinnacle of his creation, he creates human beings and calls them these image bearers in order to act as his ambassadors for him on earth. And part of what is going on here in the ancient Near East is an image was a statue or a symbol for a king that ruled in a particular area. And when you saw the king's image, it served to remind you that this was their land or this was their territory. The Egyptians were pros at this. They embodied their pharaohs and enormous statues in order to remind the people of who exactly ruled around here. And it's in this context that these verses are being written. Human beings are made bearing the mark of the king as a reminder over all of creation that this is God's and we are God's. Anyone who remember, anyone who remember, uh, excuse me, anyone remember the second commandment in the big list of 10? Do not have an idol, right? Or rather, do not make an image of God that is not God. Why? In part because those already exist. Those already exist. Human beings are made in the image of God, and we are in some sense his representation on planet Earth. And practically what this means is that all people everywhere have inherent value and worth. 
all people mean something to God. All people matter to him and are worthy of being treated as those who carry his image. No matter who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what they've done or how they struggle or anything else, because they are made in God's image, they have value. And being treated with dignity then is not something that has to be earned or merited, And it shouldn't have to be something that's asserted either. I love what God says to Peter in the vision. Peter says, God, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice says, what God has made clean, do not call common. Don't you call something that I have cleaned or rather redeemed common. Don't look at the work of my hands and take this dismissive or superior attitude to it. And Peter realizes he's talking about people. He's not just talking about food. Don't take this mentality of like, oh, because I'm I'm this way and not that way, I'm better than so-and-so. Because I come from these people or this is my ethnicity or this is my background, I'm better than so-and-so. He's like, don't look at that. No, all people matter to me. All people are mine. All people are are who I have bled and died for and they are to be treated as such. And let me just take a minute and say this. This is a big deal. And you should be a really big fan of this, even if you're not a Christian, because you need more than an assertion to combat the worst things that human beings do to each other. You need more than assertions to combat things like racism or sexism or slavery or really anything that deals with human rights, because without this fundamental truth that human beings are made in God's image, you can't really argue that human beings inherently have any valuable, any any value, excuse me that we are any different than a tree or an animal or whatever else, or, and that we shouldn't be taken advantage of or oppressed or whatever else by others. And you might be thinking, that's ridiculous. Of course we can believe in human rights without being a Christian or, or believing in God. Yeah, of course you can believe in human rights without believing in these things. I'm saying you can't argue for it, okay? You can believe it, you just have a hole in your worldview. You might also say like, well, what are you talking about? Isn't that obvious? No, actually, it's not. First of all, it's not obvious, and it hasn't been obvious to most people throughout history. It's just sort of in our unique Western time where we kind of just naturally assume that all human beings have rights. But for many folks across the globe, this has not been the case. And there's still plenty of cultures out there who think that humanity is broken up into tiers or classes or castes based on race or religion or gender or wealth or whatever else, and that some are more valuable and more worthy of life than others. Secondly, it's an assertion, not an argument. And you need more than that. Like, have you ever noticed that trying to tell a racist that racism is bad tends to be unpersuasive? Have you noticed that? Hey, dude, racism is wrong. Well, I don't think so. Well, it is. Nuh uh. Yeah, huh? Why? Because it is. We all know it is. Skin, we all know that skin complexion and, eth- and ethnicity don't make people better than others. Says who? You? Who are you? Look, racism is wrong because every human being on planet Earth, no matter who they are, where they are, when they are, what they've done or what group they belong to is made in God's image. That's why racism is wrong. That's why sexism is wrong. That's why oppression and brutality and murder and genocide and all these other things are wrong because human beings are special. They are made in God's image and thus have value for simply being who they are. And it boggles my mind how some secular people will simultaneously argue that you shouldn't oppress the poor because of human rights, but then also hold the position that we are, in the words of secular philosopher Bertrand Russell, accidental collocations of atoms, that no real purpose or no feeling and no action or whatever else could possibly change. Like, do we not see the inconsistency in that? Which are we? Are we just a random assortment of atoms who have no purpose? Or are we fundamentally something worth preserving? When a lion devours a gazelle, nobody cries foul. We just say, that's natural. So how can it be wrong for powerful people to take advantage of weaker people? It's natural, right? Of course not. We know there's something fundamentally wrong with that. And look, I I know that was a rant, but the point being, the church is meant to be the place in the world where the rubber and the road meet on human value, where it's not just believed, but it's lived out. That there's no type of person, no type of person that God refuses to love. There's no type of person that he will turn away from if they repent and believe. 
That's what's unfolding in Acts 10 and 11. Image bearers of all types and kinds, big and small, light-skinned, dark-skinned, medium-skinned, tall and short, attractive and unattractive, funny and serious, uptight and easygoing, rule followers and rebels, old and young, rich and poor, cool and total nerds, all, all of them are welcomed through faith and repentance to belong to God. Every one of them to be God's people forever. Point being, no one is off limits. When it comes to God's people, no one is off limits. It doesn't matter who they are. If they trust in Jesus for salvation, they are brother. They are sister. You see, our God is unbelievably inclusive. He accepts and invites and welcomes in people from every nation, every tribe, every language, every socioeconomic status, every gender, every race, every background. He welcomes people no matter their past, no matter what awful, evil, or heinous things they've done. If they place their faith in Jesus and trust in him as Lord and Savior, they are welcomed in. That is true for them, and that is true for you as well. And Cornelius' story tells us that we are to welcome them in too, to honor the image of God in one another. Every person who walks through our doors, whether that's here or in your life group, every person you encounter at your job or in your neighborhood or at the ball field is an image bearer of God, a person to be loved, a person to be valued, a person to be invited to repent, believe the gospel, and become a part of God's forever family. Look, that is truly the incredibly beautiful thing about God's church. That's the beautiful thing about who we are as a people, that everyone is welcome from all different walks of life, from all different backgrounds, everyone is welcome. And everyone who repents and believes belongs. Everyone. If you're rich or poor, if you trust and follow Jesus, you belong. If you're black or white or brown, if you trust and follow Jesus, you belong. If you're single or you're married, if you trust and follow Jesus, you belong. If you struggle with heterosexual sin or homosexual sin, if you repent and trust in Jesus, you belong. If you have your life together or don't even know what having your life together means, if you trust and follow Jesus, you belong. This is the beautiful part of the church. We are all so different, but because of Jesus, we all belong. But that leads me to the second thing that we see here. If this is going to be a reality for our church, then it's going to require some things of us. Namely, to use the language of the text, it's going to require that we refuse to stand in God's way. It's going to require that we refuse to stand in God's way. I mean, this idea is beautiful, right? Like, I love that God operates this way. But my experience is that while we love the idea of this, we often don't love the reality of it nearly as much. We tend to like the idea of what it means, but because the reality, but we don't like the reality because the reality is often really, really difficult and really complicated. In fact, the inclusion of the Gentiles actually becomes one of the most difficult things for the early church. It causes one of the first huge theological controversies that they have to tackle. We'll see that in a few weeks in chapter 15. But it's also a subject consistently approached in the majority of Paul's letters. Like he's just constantly writing this to the people to help them see, hey, these, this dividing wall that used to exist between you, it's no longer there. Jesus has broken it down. It's a big deal. And you can even see that in this passage. In verse 28, and he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. For what it's worth, this is not something that God ever said in the Torah or the books of the law in the Old Testament. This was about later developed customs of strict Jewish traditions about uncleanliness. Jewish tradition, the Jewish traditions of purity made it virtually impossible for them to associate with Gentiles without becoming ritually unclean. And when the disciples hear of it in chapter 11, they're like, what are you doing? Don't you know we're not supposed to do this? Don't you know we're not supposed to be around people like that? I mean, now think about this. These people that you've thought your entire life as being unclean and unholy, people who live differently than you, who think differently than you, who have always been considered outsiders to your insider, these people show up to your life group and are like, we're in now, we're here. What do you think that moment is gonna be like? I'll tell you, awkward. 
it's going to be really awkward. If there was ever a type of person that it'd be difficult for an ethnic Jew to be in fellowship with, Cornelius and the Gentiles would be the leading candidates. If there was a type of person that would make them uncomfortable or uneasy or feel awkward around, a centurion would be the one to make it weird, okay? But had the disciples not embraced this reality and welcomed the centurion into the family, they would have been standing in the way of what God was doing. And that actually goes for us too. So let, so let me talk about us for just a minute. You and I are nearly constantly told that we cannot experience fruit, a fruitful life, that we cannot experience joy and health and healthy relationships unless we are comfortable and that we, and we are getting our preferences, right? Like this, this is kind of how we're sold products, isn't it? Products and experiences. You might call it consumerism. And in a lot of ways, I enjoy it. I'll be honest with you. I love to be comfortable. I really do. I like getting my preferences way better than I don't like, like not getting them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you guys are with me. But the point is, is we don't all just buy the same car. We buy the car that suits what we like, budget notwithstanding. We don't just buy clothes. We buy the clothes that are our pre pre preference and make us feel good and comfortable. And I could do this with everything that we basically buy every single thing every day. But the problem is, is if you try to baptize your preferences or your comfort, if you spiritualize it, you will end up actively standing in God's way. You will end up working against the very things that God is trying to do in the church and in the world. Here's what I mean. This passage shows us that to belong to the church will necessarily mean being in fellowship with people who are different than you, very different than you. Maybe different age, different gender, maybe a different race, maybe a different economic position, certainly different in spiritual maturity. And those differences are not superficial. Hear me on this. Those are not superficial or small things, but they actually contribute substantially to what we prefer and how we feel comfortable in life. Here's what I mean. Typically, do older people like to listen to their music at the same volume as younger people? Typically. No, absolutely. Usually, they don't. And I'm pretty sure that was one of our older folks who answered that question. So noted, I hear you. You are, not, you are known and loved, all right? You are known and loved. Typically, would a group of black Americans listen to the same style of music as a group of white Americans? Typically. No. Usually there'll be a noticeable absence of Garth Brooks, right? Like, it's just not, not going to happen. And you may not know this, but those differences, they also affect all kinds of other things, all kinds of other things, the way in which we talk and have conversations, how we feel like it's appropriate to speak to other people, the amount of personal privacy we expect to keep, even with close friends. These differences affect how much we like tradition. They affect what we think is appropriate to share in a group setting. They affect how expressive we are when we're singing together on Sunday. They affect our view on politics, on what's important and what's not important and how we should vote. And I could go on and on and on. These things affect all kinds of stuff. These differences are not superficial. They are significant. But as soon as you spiritualize them and say, God prefers things the way that I prefer them. And if you're gonna follow God, you gotta do like me. You gotta be like me you got to think like me, and so forth and so on, we're doomed. Because God is going to save people who are very different from you and who do not prefer the same things that you prefer. And I'm not talking about like righteousness versus sin. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about all the second tier things who just look at life differently than you look at it, who have different experiences and were shaped differently than you were. So they think differently about secondary matters. You, God is gonna save people who are vastly different from you. And when that happens, you will either start requiring something from people that God does not require or you will bail on them. That is what happens. Likely both you will begin to believe that you are unable to belong with people who aren't just like you. You'll say things like, ah, I just don't feel like I can connect to God the way they worship because that's just not my style. That's just not how I like things. Or, oh, mm, they don't parent like we do. So we, we can't really be around their family because hmm, we don't really know what's gonna happen. You know what I'm saying? We need to be around families who do things the way we do them. I think that's where we can really thrive. 
or I'd grow more if I were just around people in my same season of life or at my level of spiritual maturity. And if you want to know if you're spiritually mature or not, I'll give you a hint. Spiritually mature people don't talk about getting people on their level of spiritual maturity. You know what I'm saying? All right. But we'll say things like that. We'll think about that. I've even heard people say, like, I can't be in a group with someone who would vote that way or who would vote for that person. Listen, if how they voted in an election prevents you from loving them and having a relationship with another follower of Christ, then you have so missed the point, I do not know where to start. Can I just say that? You've missed the point. Like, I would rather you vote for the wrong person than break fellowship with a Christian because you think they voted for the wrong person. Like, do you realize how anti-Christian all of those things sound? Do you hear that? How anti-Christian all of that is. Like, you might not be able to see yourself associating with someone different than you, but here's the thing. Your Savior, Jesus, 1,000% does. He came for those who were different than him. He came for those who were not like him to make them his own, to bring them into his family. I love how Hebrews 2 talks about this. He says, for he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. You hear that? Jesus is not ashamed to call anyone a brother that he has saved. He is not ashamed to call anyone from any background, whatever it may be, that if they are his, he is not ashamed to call them his own. And hear me, that includes you. You are different than Jesus. You know that, right? Like you are not like him. He did not sin. And guess what you do all the time? You sin all the time. And he didn't let that stand in the way of you becoming his. He said, no, this person is different than me and I love them and I'm bringing them in. Like you and I are sinners. Like we are the ones who would have made it weird for the Trinity, all right? And God still chose to come after us. He still chose to come after us and make us his own. And for us to treat other image bearers any other way than how he treats us is to stand in his way. It is to get in the way of what he is doing in the world. And to top it off, this way of thinking is not how anyone actually grows as a Christian. No one actually steps into the fullness of who God is trying to make them to become by thinking this way. Spiritualizing your comfort and your preferences, it does not produce sanctification. In fact, it stands in the way not only of what God is trying to accomplish on earth, but what he's trying to accomplish in you as well by making you a person who becomes like him. I love how Paul will say it later in Philippians. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Listen, this is not just an individual moral command. It's actually a prerequisite for the church to be able to function. The more addicted we are to our way, the more quickly we will be to stand in God's way. The more addicted you are to your way, the more quickly you will be to stand in God's way. This passage says that when I take the form of a servant and set my interests and preferences aside, I am actually becoming more like Jesus who did this very thing in order to accomplish my salvation. When I deny myself in these ways, when I lay myself down and welcome those who I would have originally thought were on the outside, I'm actually becoming more like Jesus. We tend to think that the only way I can thrive is to be in a place or around the people that make me comfortable. Often though, especially with God, the uncomfortable place is actually the thriving place where we're not comfortable, but we're pressed in the ways that we didn't even know we needed to be pressed. And as strange as it sounds, the difficulty is God's gift to you. The difficult people, even, are God's gift to you. Just like God had something he wanted to do in Peter's uncomfortable situation, he wants to do that in us as well. Because here's the truth. You didn't know that that person in your life group was going to bother you. Like you didn't know when you got in, but they do. They cannot read a social cue to save their life. They don't know when to be quiet. 
and it's driving you crazy. And it's like, it's like you're just like, hey, guys, can we just do one social aptitude test? Like, just one? Like, that's all I'm asking. Like, just get, get everybody on the same page here at least. Like, you didn't, you didn't know that that person was going to trigger you in the way that they do, but they do. You didn't know how deep-seated your preferences were going to be. And you didn't know you were going to be uncomfortable around them until you were. What I want you to see and what I think the encouragement of this text for us is that is in those moments, there's an invitation. There's an invitation for all of us. The invitation to not stand in God's way, but embrace what God is doing. That he is at work in ways and in people that are far greater than any of us have ever imagined. And part of that work is in you, like it was in Peter before you, to see as God sees to love as God loves, to not call common what God has declared clean. To see that person in a different season of life than you, that person who parents differently than you, that person of a different ethnicity or a different tax bracket or is further left or right from center than you are, if they trust and follow Jesus, to see them as your brother or your sister in Christ, loved and saved by God, and they are not a bug in the system but actually a feature of it. And when you get to life group this week and they're going on and on like they usually do because apparently they didn't get the subtle hint in this sermon, I want you to smile. (laughs) You're welcome. You're welcome. When that happens, I want you to smile. I want you to smile knowing that by setting aside your comfort and welcoming them, you are becoming more like Jesus. The work that God wants to do in you is happening in those moments. And I want us to marvel at how powerful the gospel must really be to have you be sticking it out with someone like that, someone so different from you. And I want you to see the opportunity that you're getting to step into to honor the image of God and one another and show off the beauty of what God is actually doing in the world. Because here's the truth. Church, I'm not going to hide this from you. It really is hard. It really is hard to step in to who God has made us to be. It really is hard. But when it happens, it really is beautiful too.